my name is Chelsea McLeish. It's the 7th of May 2021. And John, could you state your name, um, your age, your date of birth, please? Yeah, my name is John Calder, and I must be 72 because I was born 10-9-48. Thank you. So this is part of the Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership um, project. It's socially distanced encounters of the rural kind. Oh, yeah. John, do you mind just running down, like just a quick rundown of your life? Just blimey, how can I do that quickly? Or... I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like... uh, here we go. So, mm -hmm. um, I was born as a farmer's son. For a long time, it looked like I might become a farmer, but uh, my father and mother had two sons, and the younger one was maybe not as keen at doing stuff at school as I was. And kind of by default, it was decided that um, dad could set up one farm, but he couldn't set up two, so maybe I ought to go to university. And that was a significant turning point because I discovered that there was the rest of the world. Um, and West Dorset wasn't the only thing going on. So much as I love West Dorset, I went up to London University, did mathematics, um, for no better reason than the fact that maths was my favourite subject at school. And at university, I discovered it was no longer my favourite subject because it was too difficult. Um, so scratching around, I decided that I'd better do something that could get me into um, business generally. Uh, sales and marketing and logistics was what I ended up doing. So. To transition to that, I ended up doing um, an MSc in business studies at City University, started off in market research, did some marketing with various companies and ended up for 27 years with an American company called 3M. Uh, marketing, sales and logistics is what I was involved in. And lucky for me, I could retire relatively early at a time when I just inherited some farmland which of course I had never farmed since I was a teenager. I spent a lot of my teenage years milking cows instead of chasing girls, which is a bit of a frustration at the time. But in fact, um, growing up slow isn't a bad thing. So um, came back with um, the expectation that I have to manage some land that I've inherited and why don't I try and enjoy it by um, learning how to do it properly. And during that period, when I was at school, say, uh, everything to do with farming was about intensifying farming, getting as much milk out of every cow, getting as much grass out of every field as you could. Um, but by the time I'd retired, like this must be 50 years later, the whole emphasis was different. It was all about conservation and protecting wildlife and nobody gave to hoots about how much milk you produce from each cow other than the farmer himself because he wanted to make a profit and so i was lucky really because i came back into managing this land at a point where managing the farming part of it was not the focus where whereas um conservation of the hedges and the woodlands and um helping diversity had become the focus of defra the government body that's in charge of farming. So um, I waded into getting involved with my own land on the basis of doing very practical things. I went away and did a one year um, countryside management course to learn how to lay hedges and coppice in the woodlands and to generally look after animals, which I already knew about that. But it was mainly about looking after wild animals or looking after their habitats. And as it turns out, I discovered I really enjoyed laying a hedge and uh, never knew what charcoal making had been until I went on this one year course and they did charcoal making as part of it, as a traditional country craft. It was fascinating. So I ended up getting my own kiln. Um, but there was a story there because I kind of chased all around the country in the UK to try and find a second hand kiln. Um, and they were scarce because it was actually in decline as an industry. But then uh, I was talking to somebody, which is unusual because I'm not very social. 
Um, I was talking to somebody while I was doing a bit of hedge laying and said I was interested in getting hold of the charcoal kiln. And he said, well, why don't you talk to, I can't remember the guy's name now, in Morecambe Lake. So that's two miles away. Somebody who had been making charcoal and had given up had a redundant kiln. So this was too good to be true. And I snatched that off him um, and spent 10 years making charcoal. And then I discovered that actually it's a young man's job, so I shouldn't be doing it. Uh, but while, while I was doing that, I ended up getting fascinated by the process, um, enjoying the fact you stay up overnight to watch the damn thing. And it's all hot on a cold night. And it's really exciting because it's glowing red inside over dramatic um, but what I enjoyed was out of this kiln the next day when it was cooled down and you can look at what you've got all the charcoal you've got was an exact replica of the wood you'd put in so all the fibers that made up the structure of the wood if you left it big enough to see what was going on as it went in it came out in the same shape and structure which for some reason was a surprise to me so it's as well as it's uh, a process that destroys the wood that goes in, it preserves the structure of the wood that goes in. And I just found that fascinating. So it kind of laid in the back of my head as an observation. I was thrilled by that. But then I started realizing that um, interesting pieces of wood that came out of my hedge laying and coppicing and charcoal making practices activity, um, kind of began to sort of sound like they needed something doing something different than just being burnt. So I ended up piling up this. But then I realized that a guy called David Nash um, had made an art practice out of piling up logs of wood and charring it and, and sort of got into looking at what he was doing and realized that I better do something like that in my spare time too. So I discovered land art through David Nash and accidentally falling in love with charring. Um, I also, along the way, noticed that Andy Goldsworthy was doing some really wonderful things with natural materials. So um, latched on to the aesthetics that he was finding and just taking natural materials and making a composition of them. His work is typically very transitory. It's very temporary it, it kind of blows away in the wind if you're not careful and he takes hours making something which does blow away in the wind so he's a total head case frankly um, but at least he photographs it before it blows away and then you've got something on a photograph um, and then i got curious about um various crafty processes that were going on i went on a willow weaving course so one day a two-day course, actually. A two-day course with Caroline Sharp. She's an art willow weaver from Weymouth. And she does really beautiful work, sculptures. Not like willow woven um, rabbits or deer or stuff like that. She does just um, organic shapes, basically. Pods, vessels, things like that. Um, and so... That really got me fascinated because I realized from what she was showing me that not only could I weave willow together to make a structure from willow, but the various ways in which you can use the properties of willow, which is good tensile strength, and if it's wet, it will bend without snapping, which is unusual for a twig. Um, I could use that to assemble different pieces of wood together. And through that, I ended up discovering that I could make sort of lattice structures out of the hazel that was coming out of my hedge and woodland management and weave them together in these lattices and make all kinds of big structures. So that's how I discovered I was an artist in the end. And I, I'm not sure how much craft is involved. I suppose there's some... Uh, hand skills that come from knowing how to lay a hedge and how to make charcoal and how to coppice so there's some kind of practical things that i i'm afraid i imagine that centuries ago when it was practice it was done purely to have a functional outcome like you end up with a hedge that works as a hedge you end up with a woodland that generates more wood than it did would otherwise do because you keep on promoting the the plant to regenerate 
young fast growth. Um, and if you make charcoal, then obviously you're trying to make something that someone will buy because they want to have a hot burning fuel. So I guess traditionally those crafts were undertaken by people who had an outcome which was to do with a very practical outcome. But I've discovered that two thirds of my time is spent seeking aesthetic outcomes rather than practical ones. Although there's quite a bit of practical stuff that you need to do because if you're like growing as I am a new hedge, I've just planted a new hedge on the perimeter of our garden. Um, you need to protect it from the deer. So I end up making structures that persuade the deer they don't need to go and look at my hedge. So there are some practical things, but in the main, um, I get a lot of fun out of making stuff out of bits of wood. In amongst that, I got married twice. I had two kids on the second attempt of being married and I'm very happily married now. I should mention that. <laughs> it's good to hear. Um, I'd love to go back to, we'll talk about your art in a second, but I'd really like to know about when you did more of the woodman's management. So the yeah. hedge day and the coppice and the charcoal burning. Yeah. Um, if you could tell me a few of your experiences with that, that would be amazing. Well, um, hedge laying is a pretty lonely process. I might have to say that every time I talk about all these things. You're out there doing it. Uh, it's very unusual to have a mate who's going to do it with you. Uh, curious members of the family might show up and enjoy the fact you've got a little bonfire with a Kelly kettle making a cup of tea and they think that's quaint and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. rarely involved with other people. So hedge laying, uh, actually, it's quite easy to learn how to do it. Um, but it's not necessarily easy to learn how to do it well. And I had um, the opportunity when I joined um, the Dorset Coppice Group. I did that because they were clued up on managing woodland locally and they were clued up on making charcoal. And so it was like a, a club of people trying to do the same thing. And amongst them, there were people who were really expert at hedge laying, and I got one of them to come and have a look at my hedge that I'd laid. And he was quite happy with what I was doing, but he pointed out that it really ought to be laid closer to the bank so that every bleacher, as they call it, the stems that you lay over, would touch the bank and shoot new roots down into the bank at the point where it touches it. So I was able to pick up an improvement there. Um, since then, I have laid probably seven kilometers or so of hedge. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot of hedge. Yeah. Um, it's nearly all the hedge I've got. And the farmer who I sell my field grass to is a very traditional farmer and he insists that um, you mustn't cut a hedge um, less frequently than once a year. So that's very controversial right now because um, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but here we go. Uh, because, because of biodiversity interests, people would prefer you to not cut your hedge every year because they want to allow they want you to allow the, the flowering and the fruiting of that hedge to happen so that through the winter, the wild animals, the birds, the mammals, the insects have all got something in the way of nourishment. So um, there is a little issue there that uh, I do make sure that a lot of my hedges um, are not cut every year. And they are the ones that are usually on the edge of a woodland or on the edge of a stream. Uh, they're not the main ones that separate fields. Uh, they've got a functional job of keeping animals in one field and out of the other one. But I, I go along with my, my tenant's idea that um, if you cut your hedge every year, you're only cutting small material. And the material and the machine they use these days is a flail. It's a, it's a, a tractor mounted thing, a lot of hammers rotating very fast, smashing the wood to pieces. If you present that piece of equipment, it's a very brutal piece of equipment, to something that's been growing for three years, 
it will damage it, not just where it hits it, but all the way down to the roots. And so our theory, and I think it's very practical and realistic, is that if you delay your hedge trimming so that you can give all this extra fruit every year to the wildlife, you actually bring about um, the early demise of your hedge. You'll make gaps arise, and it makes it realistic to expect that Instead of doing hedge laying on a 40 year cycle, which is perhaps what the people think it was typical, you might have to do it every 15 years or something. And these days, there's a new um, aspect to all this, which is the carbon sequestration that happens in a hedge. So because of global warming, we're all very worried about the global warming thing and farming has got a big part to play in undoing some of the global warming that comes from the methane that's exuded from, breathed out from the cows and the sheep, for example. Um, we've got to worry about where could we compensate from that, for that by drawing carbon back into the soil or the plants that we've got. And hedges are good and woodlands are good at capturing the carbon. So uh, we're now talking about it being incentivized that you allow your hedges to grow tall so that they capture more carbon. And yet I think there's a, a bit of flawed thinking going on there because it means that you're not cutting every year with this flail. You're going to cut every three years or more and that will damage the hedge. And in the end, you'll end up having to lay it more frequently than otherwise. And every time you lay a hedge, you eliminate that year's Fruiting, so that's one year completely gone in terms of diversity, in terms of providing food for animals, wild animals. But also, uh, there's a lot of waste material that gets burned. And obviously, if you burn a lot of woody material, you're putting carbon dioxide back in the air. So, me and my, my grazing neighbor believe that DEFRA have got it wrong and they shouldn't, and the NFU have got it wrong, then they shouldn't be insisting that people leave their cutting for three years they should be uh, allowing a certain amount to go every year so a uh, bit of controversy there for you yeah and that's just a hedge lane coppicing i didn't really um do as much coppicing in terms of having an impact on the woodland i've got there's still scope to do more of that but what i did seemed to work okay and it was the main source of wood that was turned into charcoal. I suppose when I stopped a couple of years ago making charcoal, that's when my activity in coppicing kind of stopped, full stop. And I hope to be able to go back and do a bit more of that. But during um, this period of COVID, it's become obvious that you stay at home more than you go away any place. Um, and I focused more on developing the suitability of the local site. So around the farm, we've got, we live in a house that was a cow store, it's been converted. Uh, my son lives in a house that was actually a tractor shed, it's been converted. And so the rest of the block is just old farm buildings that are now a workshop, uh, a wood store, it was pigsties, a uh, potting shed that was the original farmhouse. So we got, yeah, we got, mm -hmm. A potting shed that's the size of the original farmhouse kitchen that's crazy yeah anyway um so any amongst all that there's some land that's not part of the farm and i'm developing more flower meadows and a bit of new woodland in amongst that and also i've got loads of my sculptures hanging around there so charcoal making um well, that was more interesting than I expected it to be. Um, kept me busy and happy for a long time. It was probably the most important element of returning to Charmouth. I live in Charmouth, West Dorset. I was brought up in Charmouth, West Dorset, but having gone away to university and staying away in the Southeast, um, nobody down here, apart from the people I went to school with who didn't leave, Nobody down here knows me, and the rest of the family aren't known here. So coming back, the thing that thrust me into the local activity in the village was the fact I was making charcoal and 
selling it through the regional, the, the, the local retail outlets and the farm shops and stuff. And so there was an ongoing dialogue between me and a lot of traders, and that ended up developing into quite a good networking activity. On the other hand, there was the occasional near neighbor who was really not happy to have a lot of smoke turning up. And, uh, and so there was quite an issue to manage there. I had to start watching the forecast to work out which way the wind was blowing to make sure that when I started my kiln, which is like a massive explosion of smoke for a few hours, um, it wouldn't blow into their garden. That makes sense. When you did the charcoal burning, did you ever do, because I'm assuming you had a steel kiln, did you ever do an earth burn at all while you Yeah, were? yeah, I, I, not on my own, um, mm -hmm. but I, we, we did an earth burn, not on the course, but as a consequence of meeting people who were keen to go off and do one of those. So I've done an earth burn a couple of times. And that is something where you have to watch it very closely all the time, otherwise it will take off. But it was, it was fun. Yeah, really good. Okay. What was your like, it, do you have any favorite memories from the earth burn? Because I think that's one of the bits of my research I found the most interesting. Like it just sounds like a quite a, like a communal activity. And it just sounds, it yeah, sounds like it, it'd be fun. It was, it was fun. It, it was a group of people I suppose there were maybe 20 of us there. And so it was like a campsite because you knew you were going to be there for a couple of days. There was a lot of work to do, which everybody piled into. Um, there was the big event of, of lighting the damn thing. And so the people who knew what they were doing were the people who became very animated at that point. So they, they had they had red scarves around their face to stop the smoke going in their face. And they, they, they sort of dressed up like gypsies to make it seem dramatic. Uh, and it was dramatic. So that was fun. And then we ended up taking turns keeping watch. So you have to pour water over it at points when it's starting to get out of control and block up holes with grass, pour water on that. It was, it was like very, very very unusual. This is my wife Sue walking by. That's Chelsea. Hello. Hi Sue, nice to meet you. And you. We've just got on to charcoal making now. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, and the earth burn was fun, um, but it's not something I want to do on my own. It, it scares me the extent to which that could go wrong. Yeah, I, I could imagine. It seems like a lot of constant attention and making sure everything's smooth sailing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So I'm guessing through your charcoal burning, because I know um, one of the other people I've spoke to, he said that one of the bits, like the bits of charcoal that he burned, he often could, it could be used as drawing charcoal. Do you ever use that with your artwork? Yeah. It, um, rarely, I, I rarely used it, but I made it for the fun of it. And sometimes I would use some. It was... Um, it was more interesting for me to find um, cones or other small, compact, woody type shapes, acorns, stuff like that, and put them in a tin and drop the tin in the middle of the charcoal kiln. And then when you close down everything and you gather your, your charcoal out, that tin would be in the bottom there somewhere and everything you put in it would just be char and in perfect shape you know you'd be intact still <coughs> so so that was fun exploring how you could preserve a little branch or a little cone or something i think you're choking just a part of like an experiment with the yeah with the burn. that sounds interesting so yeah. i know you said that um yeah you said it was a young man's craft now yeah. um why do you think that specifically is it just because a lot of the like with the coppicing and stuff is it just because it's <coughs> kind of like it, manual labor there's loads of manual labor there's no avoiding the manual labor mm -hmm. and um there's loads of driving around to try and flog the stuff uh it's probably not particularly good for your health there's a lot of smoke involved so you know I'd had enough after 10 years because it was just getting too much pressure, actually, having built up successfully a customer base 
it was too much pressure in a good summer to provide enough charcoal at the time people wanted it. Yeah, that and makes sense. I pass it on to and a younger then, man. Obviously, you said that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I think the internet cut out a little bit there. What was your last sentence? Sorry, John. Uh, I think I might have said that um, there was a lot of pressure to keep up with demand and it was a good summer and I passed it on to a younger man to deal with. Makes sense. Do you think that's why, I know you said earlier you think it's a bit of a decline in trade and it was hard to get a hold of a kiln. Do you think that's probably one of the reasons why because it's a lot of intense work all the time? Yeah, I, I don't know how anybody could make a living doing it. And I know people do try to. Um, the Dorset Charcoal Company is all over the place. So they're they're producing charcoal in vast quantities. Yeah. Um, and it must work for them. But I would think they must have a fairly frugal existence. And that's not for me. <laughs> Makes sense. So about your um, artwork, I was looking at obviously like all the photos, the videos that you've sent over. Um, could you explain your process a bit for me, please? Process. All right. Well, generally speaking, um, an artwork will emerge maybe two years after the piece of material I've made it from yeah. has come into my possession. So it'll either be hanging around the, the yard for years, just being ignored, or it will be chosen as something that feels like it has potential, but I don't know what it's gonna be. So I stack that more carefully. Um, and then a moment arises when I feel I need to do something and whatever mood, I don't know, I can't explain it, but a particular piece of wood might be, um, making me feel that I, I've got to deal with it today and I'll make a start. And usually I manage to dream up something that's going on in my head that seems to be um, a purpose. Uh, these things don't really belong together. The piece of wood was there for a long time. I knew it had an interesting shape. Um, I do some work on it. I discover that there's, like the thing I'm doing now with this, um, gender debate thing. I've just sawn up that piece of wood in ways that felt interesting to me, given the shape it started off at. And I put on it a sort of grid with the chainsaw and then charred it. So I've now got some sort of motifs that occur around it. And where I cut it, there were some cavities inside the wood that I wouldn't have done was there, but they emerge when I cut it with the chainsaw down the middle. And so I've tried out that and it's kind of step by step process of seeing what do you discover when you process it? And then what does it hint to you that might be sensible to do next? And the danger is only the, the danger of going too far. You can make something too complicated to be aesthetically pleasing. You can um, undo some good work you've done. So that there's quite a lot of do it to the next stage, leave it alone, walk away and come back to it some other time and decide whether it's nearly finished or whether you have to start again, that kind of thing. So it's a chaotically disorganized step-by-step -step process where I'm cautiously moving forward with the processes I know about, using a chainsaw cutting, I might use a draw blade and, and shave something rather than cut it. Um, I like doing the charring process. Sometimes use a branding iron of some sort. So there are alternative ways in which I can make a mark. And the people I mix with who are what I would call proper artists, they do drawings and they use paints and stuff. There's quite a lot of talk about mark making in that community. And I kind of uh, feel sympathetic with that in that what I like to do is to do with texture um and making marks and the mark making process is, is what it's all about for me i don't try and make a likeness with anything um trying to make something which is just a curiosity really so the process is a kind of stumbling forward a bit at a time using the um, 
various techniques that I know I've got a master of now until I'm happy with the outcome. It does sound quite a similar, if you're just saying it like that, it does sound like quite a similar process to woodland management. Like it is quite a, a long process, quite complicated at times if you're not sure what the outcome is going to be. But it sounds very rewarding. Yeah, yeah, I think it's both those things. I think it is similar to the management in that you can walk away from it for a long time and come back and that won't be a big problem. Um, and you can expect that if you coppice a hazel tree, that it will regrow. And you do know that if you don't protect the regrowth from deer, they'll ruin it. So you have to protect it with a cage. Um, so there's, there's some obligations that you have to follow to make sure the outcome's got a chance of being good. But in the end, nature has got a big part in whether the outcome is as it should be or not. And it's the same in my art practice, I think, in, in that if, I, if I'm not careful, the potential of that piece of wood will be lost because I made a casual cut that goes right through something which I ought to have kept there. So that's, there are some parallels, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. What's your, um, what would you say your favourite thing about working with nature, both like back then and now with your craft is? Because it sounds like the unpredictability of what's going to come out with the like artwork and your sculptures. That seems yeah. like something that would probably be the best. I think it is. I think um, I've developed a sense of confidence that something will come out of this work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I forget the ones that don't work. You just ignore it. Um, but very often it does come out in a way that I'm happy with, which is what I'm doing for, really. Um, and yeah, the fact that you get a surprise uh, is really great. And there's nothing more surprising than blossom coming out on the apple tree at this time of year right now. I mean, three days ago, there wasn't any blossom. And now, every tree that we've got that's an apple tree, we've got a bunch of blossom everywhere. It's, it's fantastic. So even though that's predictable, you can't predict it to the day, but it will happen every spring. When it happens, it's a real big surprise. Brilliant. Yeah, I like that. What's like your, out of the most recent sculptures you've done, what's the most interesting one that you, or what's the one you, you most enjoyed working on? Uh, well, I suppose it's always the last one because that's the one that we've been focusing on, but yeah. um, probably the one I'm most proud of, if, if that's the right word, I think it is, mm -hmm. um, is the crack and warp column, which I just did as a sort of, I saw a David Nash piece of work, which was totally blew my mind, really, just looking at how simple it was and how appealing it was. And most people perhaps would walk by saying, who on earth would think that's a piece of art? So, you know, I understand it's a bit of a niche. Um, so that was a crack and walk column. I picked the tree that would do the job because I wanted to emulate what he'd done. Um, and I was quite pleased with, at that stage, my chainsaw, chainsaw skills weren't great, but they were getting there and it, it sort of came out right. And I was very pleased that I was able to put a bit of charcoal in an area that made it different from what David Nash had done then. But later on, he started doing a lot of charcoal, which made me feel quite close to what he's doing. So that's, that was that was what I'm most proud of. Um, probably the piece that I think has most impact is Hillside. That was just, again, nice and simple. So that was some Y shapes that um, the forks in trunks and I cut it down in the middle so I get two sides of a Y and I ended up making a configuration that was a kind of emulation of uh, a hillside plowing and footprints of animals and stuff like that. So those are two I, I, that come to mind. Uh, but I, I'd kind of forgotten about the book that I destroyed in that exercise. But I, I'm really pleased with that as, a, as an art project. I don't know how I would look at the writer of that 
sort of you know, face to face and not too embarrassed. But... <laughs> yeah. Do you tend to prefer like bigger scale projects instead of smaller? Because I was quite surprised when you sent the book through because everything else seems to be a lot larger. Yeah, I, I, if I could have got a bigger book, I would have got a bigger book. <laughs> so yeah, I think you're right. I do like big, mm -hmm. um, but mainly, well, mainly that's a practical thing because it's the material I'm, I'm working with. I'm pretty bulky usually, um, but it's also to do with the space in which I expect to put these things. So I'm not, I'm comfortable with indoors, but I'm not an indoor person. I'm much more comfortable outdoors and there's space. To feel and I do like to feel that I can place a sculpture appropriately in its environment. So um, big helps because if you're outside, if it's small, you're not going to get noticed. Yeah, you might get lost yeah. amongst all the other nature. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing I quite like, uh, but when um, I sold a field, a few fields, to a neighbour who bought the farm that I was brought up on because um, he wanted to do like a, a wildwood sanctuary there. But I'd already put in um, a land uh, installation in the woodland that I sold to him. And I, I just left it with him and he liked it. So when people go for a walk, and go and look at his wildflower meadows and stuff like that. Part of the walk takes you past this, uh, I called it uh, log collar. So there's an oak tree in his woodland that's surrounded by a collar of piled logs that are all kind of curved in shape. And they don't touch the, the trunk. So there's a gap between this collar and the tree trunk. And it's just cute that it, it just, it kind of embraces that tree without touching it. Um, and it's been there for well, probably seven years now. And it's not washed down yet. And it's still intact. It hasn't blown away or anything. So we're all pretty pleased with that. I bet that's one of the best things about working with nature, with the, the coppice and the crafts and everything. You know a lot of it's, it's, it's going to be there for a long time and it's going to keep having an impact. That's true, but only in the, you know, on the scale of our lifetime. So most people who make sculptures make sculptures that are going to be there for centuries. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're working in land art, it's going to change so rapidly in a lifetime's perspective that um, it will be gone quite soon after we're gone. I quite like that. I quite like the fact that it changes a lot. The... Um, I don't know if you looked at the video that Simon did yet, but um, I just carved a shape out of wood that had a nice sort of pinnacle look to it, left it outside, and uh, a fungus got into it, a bracket fungus, and it's all peppered now with things that weren't there when I made it, and it's brilliant. So nature is taking over my piece of art. Yeah, I guess it's like a constant evolving piece of art because it's never going to be exactly how you made it is constantly changing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the piece I'm making now is going to go and join a few pieces at Simmons Free where I put a composite together. They're all bleached now. You don't really notice it as time passes, but the natural colour of the wood is gone and it's all bleached by the sunlight. And so this new piece will stand there. It'll have to go in the middle, otherwise it won't look right. Um, it might even not look right Anyway, but um, it's going to be interesting to see people reacting to the fact that this has gone in over the weekend to a group of sculptures that are very toned down. They've got black, but they've got grey, and they haven't got much colour. But this is going to go and join it. It's kind of a rich tan colour and black. So it will look a bit young. Yeah. I bet that will look pretty interesting when it's been put there. Definitely. I shall send you a photo. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to see it. As if you've not had enough photos and videos already. I, I enjoy, I really enjoy looking at them. I think it's so interesting to see how you've developed from doing the woodland management and that part of looking after nature to now 
turning nature into a piece of artwork? I'm not sure how it's connecting with other people, but uh, there's you, my one audience, oh, my audience is one. And yesterday, somebody with an Irish accent came through and said, oh, I like your stuff. That was great. That was great. Okay. So that's, yeah, almost international famous now. <laughs> of course, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So you said before um, that if you could go back and do like the, a charcoal burn again, you would. Do you think you'd do any of the other, like the hedge laying and stuff? Would Do you think you'd give that? Like oh yeah, shot I, I, in the future. Yeah, there's um well I now do hedge laying not as a project to try and uh rejuvenate all the hedges that I've inherited. I do hedge laying now when it's needed. So I've got arthritis in my hand, so it's not easy. Mm -hmm. I don't do much. I do very small, like two or three hours at a time and walk away. Um but I did a section of about 20 meters this year which is pathetically small, but it was great to get back there and do it again. And and the bigger the branch that I'm laying, the happier I am, because that's really challenging then to try and drop a very large, almost tree to lie horizontal without snapping the bit that's got to continuously connect it to its roots. So it's, so it's good, yeah. So I've, uh, I've no regrets at all about indulging myself with learning how to lay a hedge or to coppice. I'm a bit frustrated that I haven't had more impact in the woodland. I might get back to doing some more. Um, but now that I've been teased into spending time making artworks, I think the thing that will really bring me back into the woodland again will be those many opportunities for putting uh, an art installation in the woodland itself. There's a fallen down um, sweet chestnut which i've been looking at for years in one of my wooden areas um, it's called soggy cover because it's wet down there um, that i've been looking at every time i go for a couple of years now and i just know that at some stage i'm going to take my blowtorch down there and char it to oblivion to the point where it stands out at the moment is discreetly lying down and not making much noise. But by the time I finish charring it, it's going to stand out. I'm going to have to do that. And I imagine I'm the only person who's ever going to see it. But never mind. Yeah, I guess in that way, it's still, it's still just as exciting to do it because you never know who could see it. Like no, that's right. That's right. And you don't know how many other people who've noticed it. There might be quite a few. If they oh well, these past. people will be trespassing. Oh no! <laughs> Maybe not. Then. Not really. Not really. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to go back to and talk over? Any bits that we've missed about your art? Your no, experience? I don't think so. I would think um, I think you've got a flavour of what's going on here now. It's it's um, it's a bit odd to think of myself as an artist because most artists are earnestly trying to earn a living doing what they're doing and that's not part of what I'm doing at all. I'm a bit fortunate and I don't need to do that. I've got a pension um, and there's some income from the land so uh, I can mix doing maintenance of the land I've inherited so I feel good about that respecting that land and I can mix that with using the materials that emerge from that work and turn it into something I'm, I'm pleased with for the period that it's uh, hanging around. And it turns out there's the occasional place that now invite me to put a, an artwork in. So I've mentioned Simonsbury, but it was, um, I did a period when I was exhibiting in Lyme Regis and the person who ran that show, that curator, uh, moved to Simonsbury and they, they liked my work to be there on a long basis, so I, I get the chance to cycle it there as well. But most of my output is in what you might call my garden. <laughs> is that where your um, gender debate piece is? You were hoping to have it installed? It's, it's, it's going to go to Simonsbury, yeah, in the middle of what was already there. What was there before was called 
uh, who was it called? It was called Primal something. Not Primal Screen, that's the wrong one. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> but it's about um, nine or ten different variations on the theme of natural form. Wow. And of course, starting with natural materials, um, there's a no brainer that it's all natural form. So it was just me playing with natural form. Yeah. Is that another large piece of art? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a combination of several uh, very large pieces in one big um, courtyard, I suppose you'd call it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds so interesting. All right. Um, I think I'll wrap up and stop recording now. Okay. Um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Best.